Boards and booze, booze and boards, drink some beers, fight some hordes, drank too much, forgot our swords, ran back home, filled our gourds, got drunk again, sang some chords, boards and booze, booze and boards, with Mickey and Jeb. You know what I want to do, Mickey? Go on an adventure? Yes, yes, how did you know? <laughs> Based on the game you brought today? That's true. What game did you bring over, Jeb? I brought Aventuria. An adventure something. Aventuria. Adventure card game, that's what it's it is. Ava Aventuria. Yep. I, I I've always been, called I've it been, Aventuria. I've, I always been... call it Adventura. Oh. But I don't know how to pronounce it. You're probably right. I don't know. For the longest time, I thought there was a D after the A. Oh. Like Adventuria, but like it's the, Aventuria. You're right. But anyway, it and is And I said funny. Adventurer, which would have a D in it, so I think you're right. I'm recording that, keeping that in the... the it doesn't happen often. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is by Lucas Zack and Michael Palm. And this is a game that I found out about through the Board Game Geek forums. People were talking about different mm -hmm. kind of, uh, like, co-op adventure game type things. And this popped up, and I was like, hmm, I'll check it out. And, and it was a Kickstarter, I believe. It was. Uh, I did not know about you did it. not kick so. it. Uh, I did not kick it either because yeah. I didn't know about it. So I ended up uh, looking into it and I was like, oh, I can buy the, the core, see how it plays. Because all it is is cards. It's nothing like huge to, to deal with. So I got it. It does look like a game I would have backed, though, doesn't it? Yes, it Cause, does. Because it has an archer on the front. <laughs> That's Exactly. If you want Mickey to buy stuff, just put an archer on the front. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> well, the art's got to be good, too. Yeah, that's true. Can't be crappy art. <laughs> like it, me drawing an archer. <laughs> like, yeah. So, all right. So um, I guess it so is. So like basically we probably say dungeon well, crawl card game. Exactly. Okay. Uh, it's one to four players, 30 to 90 minutes, and 14 and up, which I think after which, having played it. Which is another reason why, it, why it's in Jeb's arsenal because it said one to four players. Yes, and I have yet to play it solo. Um, but you do like having solo games available. I do. So um, I guess it, kind of like an overview of it is uh, it, the rule book has like a storybook in it as well that kind of sets out or lays out the adventures. Mm -hmm. So you read the story, and as you go through the story, there's like different skill checks and stuff that happen along the way that affects you before you actually get to a battle. Right. And then when the battle occurs, then you set up everything like it tells you to, and then you just play, like, the scenario. Right. And then that can be linked into multiple acts that make up adventures. And they've got expansions that have other adventures. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, And there's a uh, a versus mode. Like there a, is a, a versus mode. Or they call it a duel in this game. Yeah. Right? So so you can play it sort of like uh, like a, a Magic or a Pokemon or a Yu-Gi-Oh! Right. That type of thing, just head-to-head, -head too. But for our video, we're just going to... We're only focusing on the campaign right. type of type of play. Because, for one thing, that's what he bought the game for. So yeah. if you want to see if you want to see the head-to-head -head stuff, then, you know, You can ask somewhere about else. it or for <laughs> you. Right? But yeah, like, when I, I opened the rule book and the first thing was, like, dueling, I was like, Wait a second. Oh, yeah. It's not what I thought. And right. then I flipped to the back or the second half of the book and it was like adventure mode. So that made me happy. And that's what and that's what we're doing. So again, like Jeb said, we're not going to be focusing on the dual uh, thing. I a real quick, there's almost no point on doing it. It operates almost like any other of that type of game. Yeah. But, we'll I mean, go over the mechanics, but we're not going to be like right. this is how yeah. a dual is set up yeah. or anything. Cuz again, that's for for us, the key the key to the game or the reason that it's sitting here right now is because it has a uh, scenario type adventure yeah. type playthrough. Uh, we you know uh, the head to head games. Not that this isn't any good, but they're a dime a dozen. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, it's like whatever whatever genre floats your boat. You can almost find it. Yeah. So. And uh, in the rule book, it actually said, like, it recommends playing through a duel or two just to get a feel for the mechanics. Right, right, right. And we, I I was like, okay, maybe there's a point of doing it. So I set it up with Mickey, and we played 
we played one duel, but I think after the first round, we knew. How we kind of knew how it was. Yeah. It was gonna it was gonna play out. I I will say though that it did. Uh, um, just to touch on it real quick, it did look like you were just gonna run away with it, and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, it kind of yeah. turned around. So at first, I was kind of like, well, this is unbalanced, and then it turned out that it wasn't as unbalanced as I thought it was gonna be. Right. Um, Jeb still won though, so that was kind of sad. But <laughs> barely, other than that, barely, because I was hurt. So I guess we can jump into components and stuff. Or anything yeah, else you want to say? Uh, in the core, there is a I forgot what it's called. It's like a a short adventure and then the long adventure, and we're gonna just do the short adventure because the long adventure is comprised of three acts, right. which is basically three short adventures. But kinda. they do tell you how to lead that single scenario right. into the other ones if right. you want to. So so we're just going to do that single, the pre-adventure or mm -hmm. short adventure. And if you guys enjoy the episode after you watch it, uh, just leave a comment and we'll try to do, do the like, rest of it. Yeah, yeah we'll just, just pick up where we left through. off. So. Uh, but yeah, aside from that, I think we're going to go components... How to play, set up, and the actual gameplay. Yep. And then we'll be back with our review. So. Alright, so see you in just a minute. Components will be quick. It's a card game. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go through the components of Aventuria. It's pretty quick. There's mostly cards and there's some tokens as well. So the first thing, I guess, is the rule book. We got that out in front. Uh, the first half of the rule book is, talks about the the mechanics of how to play the game and also right. kind of how dueling works and then when you get to the halfway point of it it tells you how to do the adventure so those are the adventure rules and then after you get done with the adventure rules it's the actual stories for each of the adventures in the back of the book so i guess we should start talking about the stuff that heroes have in the game so uh, when a player picks a hero you get certain things to, to help your hero out for the adventure so what do we get Jeb what do we get stop stuttering around <laughs> so the first thing you get is the hero card All right here is a hero card and then there is a I think it's called like a hero skill card and that goes with it this the skill card and then there is the heroes action deck which Fishy. there is a predetermined 30 card deck for each hero but you can customize it if you want to and I think we're just gonna go through the play with the the original 30 cards yep. so. so and there's just various like literally various cards yep and I think actually on the card there is a symbol or it's not a symbol uh, right there like that one says what is those two letters say yes yes if you look on your hero the ES is there, so that's how you determine which hero starts uh, with what. What do those say? As uh, an example. So the dwarf is DB. So there you go. Yeah, and then TM for the fire lady. So that that's not that's actually a really nice feature. Yeah. Instead and of trying to hunt certain things down. I think also in the bottom right there's uh for the set, so like that circle with the A the A inside means the core set, so Right, but it's not hero specific. That's right. just set specific. Yep. Okay. Next up is the life point counter for the hero. And that's pretty self-explanatory. You got a dial that is numbers. Yep. Yeah. Each hero is going to get a set of dice too. Yep. A d6 and a d20. And I think, what is it? On the d6, the 6 is the eyeball. That's correct, and, then, and it's kind of opposite on the D20. So the the eyeball is actually, I believe, the 20, right? The 1. I mean the 1. Sorry, I said it backwards. So they did it a little bit weird, and if I remember correctly, this is your action die, and this is your attack die. The damage. Damage. Yeah. Attack, damage, whatever you want to call it. But So they... They are for specific things. Yep. And each here, there's enough in the core set for each hero to have one of each. Right. So next up are, I guess we've got hero tokens, which there's one for each hero, and in the uh, 
the expansions, when there's more heroes, they also have them. Right. It's kind and of like a randomizer for when enemies make random yeah, attacks. It, which is kind of a really cool feature. So these aren't, like, you don't... I, these just kind of sit off to the side. They're not like they're not a marker for anything in the game. Right. But if there's an enemy out there that's you know that has gets a random attack like Jeb just said, you would like say these two pe these two heroes were playing, like shuffle them up so you can't remember which one's which. Have the have your partner flip it. That's who the monster is going to attack. Uh, I I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Then there is the first player token, which there's only one of them. It's just the big A. The big A on both sides. There are fate tokens, which heroes are going to be able to use throughout the adventure. And you don't have access to all of them. It's right. player dependent. Right. But that's they're all the same. They're all the same on the back. So those are the fate tokens. All right. Uh, there are the damage tokens, which... On the other side of them, so uh, damage tokens, and then um, they are double-sided, and I forget what the other side is called. So the other side is called an adventure token, which are the axe and the sword. And I think so, the the numbers are the same on both yes, sides of it. So. They are. So there's no confusion there. And the, and the numericals go from uh, 1, 5... 10? Is there is a 10? 10? Might not be. It goes, and then oh, it I don't see jumps, yeah. And it jumps to 20. So you got 1s, 5s, and 20s. Yep. Alright. And then there are the Doom counters and the Time counters, which are similar. Pretty self-explanatory. Time counter is the hourglass. Doom is the skull. And there you have it. So I think that wraps it up for tokens, right? Yeah, that's all the tokens. Next up are the cards that are used in the adventure mode of the game. Uh, there's a deck with all the henchmen cards. So for each adventure, it'll tell you which henchmen to use. And there's going to be a henchman deck while you're battling. So, And we'll go over the components of the cards in, in just a little bit, um, like when we go over uh, setup and gameplay, we'll tell you how to read these, but uh, they're nice. Then there are the cards that are specific to the adventure that you're playing. So we're going to be playing Saving Sylvana, and there is the time scale card, which has the different difficulties on it. So you choose how difficult you want to play the game. And then and what do you got for options, Jeff? You got what? Normal, difficult, easy, easy and legendary. Legend. Okay. So you got four different levels you can pick from. Yep. And then there are, depending on the adventure, there's random cards that'll go with it. So this one has a hero action card, and you can tell that it's a saving Sylvana, so it's used in that adventure. And this is actually the uh, the bad guy, the big bad guy for the the adventure. So that's like the boss card, right? Yeah, the boss card. Uh, there are reward cards that you can get that once you beat adventures, it'll tell you how many rewards to get and things like that. And they actually have the same back as the hero action card, so they can just be thrown in depending on the rules and stuff like that. And I think lastly are the cards that we are not going to be using in this adventure. There is an event deck that the... Now the reason he says we're not going to use it in the adventure is because this... The adventure that we're starting with is kind of... Um, I'll call it like a, like a single adventure. It's not part of a, like, of a chain together story. Um, although... At the end, they kind of give you the option of leading into the big one. Yeah. So that's why these aren't going to be used. When you go right into a campaign type of mode in this game, then these come into play. So Yeah, it'll uh, specify when right. you to use um, So basically, the, the point is, uh, after we go over this and show you how to play, shouldn't be that difficult to just add these in you know, to the, the mechanics, because you'll have everything else 
uh, down and it really doesn't, you know, it's, it's not like it changes drastically. It's just so that, uh, you, you know, that e everything changed together uh, properly, so to speak. Um, and, and I don't think Jeb already said it, but for example, these are event cards. These are leader action cards. And and these are demon ability cards. These are grave cards, and they just come into play in the Random. specific scenario oh, okay. that calls for them. So uh, for us, all that's just going to be set to the side. And then, as you saw, we're doing Saving Sylvana. The actual larger adventure is Wildenstein. If you can see that, there's three parts to it. And then they also have cards for... The chance encounter, which is just playing a random scenario. The last thing is the hero document. For when you're playing the adventure mode, that keeps track of all the information for your hero when you start leveling up and stuff like that, getting experience and reward cards. So you just fill that out as you're playing the adventure. And that, I believe, is everything for components. Alright, so... The way the rule book is laid out, it kind of has how to play the dual stuff first, and then once you get that down, you play the adventure stuff. We're actually going to kind of mix together setup and how to play an, an adventure for this section. So we've got Mickey with the rule book, and he's going to go through the short adventure stuff, and we'll just kind of show you along the way how to set up everything. First thing you do is. Pick your hero that you're going to play with. Alright, so I guess I'm going to play as the Fire Mage girl. And I will be the Archer as per normal. So I got my hero card and her skill card and, and his the 30, 30 And for the randomizers, we have both of those. And uh, then there's the first player. I have my hit point dial. I got... I have my, and remember, take your character cards out. They aren't part of the deck. And we each have two die. And then how many fate per person do we get? It is two fate per player gets put in the middle of the table. All right, so, so we get four. Four then, fate. And the rest of the fate just go off to the side because they're, yeah, they're never going to be used. Yeah, you don't, and you don't want to you, you put them way to the side so you don't, like, think that oh wait I didn't use this one yet just in case um, all the other tokens off to the side because you'll need them at random points in time yep. so at that point in time you're uh, th that's it like for literal literal setup that's it gather your hero gather all the stuff fate tokens randomizers first player put the cards in front of you uh, this obviously is going to be yep. shuffled up and then I guess we should probably talk about these two cards before we get into everything, right? Yeah, let's talk about the hero cards. So on the hero card, there are three numbers on the left side of the picture. It's an attack, or like a melee attack, a ranged attack, and a magic attack. And these are the stats for that. So when you perform one of these, you're going to roll the d20, and you need to get that number or less for it to be a success. So that's what these numbers are used for. Uh, on the right side of the card is the dodge value, which when you perform a dodge, you have to roll the d20 and get equal to or less than for a successful dodge. So just up here on the character are the different stats that you'll be using uh, for attacks and skill tests. Right, And it's exactly the same for uh, each character. Um, and like Jeb said, keep in mind what he just told you with that d20 is the main mechanic in this game. That's how you know if you're going to be, that's how you know if you succeed in an attack or anything else that you do is um, remember that the, uh, the target number is equal to or lower all the time in this game, okay? So that's, you know, and again, kind of like, you know, your typical RPG, your D20 is, uh, you know, a main, a main die in this game. And at various times during the game, which, uh, did you already talk about this part? Uh, no, I was going to okay. go through the rest of this card okay. real quick. So you've got the hero's name, which not used too much. Uh, the set, or the hero's uh, initials for the cards, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, there is an inherent attack that each hero gets 
that they can use throughout the game. So that's the information for that's there. And then there's a special ability that you can read what it does and it tells you when you can use it. And once you use it, it gets your entire card flips over and it says already used on the back. So that's so, pretty... So it's a one-time per uh, scenario, I guess I'll call it? Yeah, because I think in between acts that's you flip it. Right, so. okay. Um, just in case you're wondering, like Jeb was saying about the... Uh, the, the, these actually do stand for something. Like this is an elf scout. That's why that says ES. He's a oh really? Yeah, Thai something mage. That's why he's a TM. Where'd you find that out? I was curious. Read that. Oh, huh. yeah. Some, sometimes cool. Jeb's a little simple, so don't don't worry about that, <laughs> folks. He's really good at games, so. <laughs> okay. And the last thing is you, or one of. The other... Yeah, the next thing is the skill card for each of the heroes, which has a, a bunch of different uh, skills and then the values for that hero. So yeah. all, of, all of the heroes have the same skills, but not the same skill values. Right, and again, uh, very RPG feel. So you have that set, and again, I can't say it enough, you have to hit the target number or lower for... Uh, whenever the game tells you to make a check for whatever it is. For instance, um, I'll just go down real quick since they're all the same. You have body control, you have crafting, knowledge, perception, persuade, stealth, survival, and willpower. So and that's, I, that's all the skills. Yep, and I brought out the hero document just to show that uh, you fill in the hero name and then it has a start value for all the skills and then what you uh, can raise them throughout adventures and stuff, and then the current value, and then the rewards. So this, at this point, you could fill that the starting values and the name in when you begin the adventure. Right. And then your uh, hit point dial starts at 40? Yes. Uh, so that's how you read all your um, hero cards in the, in the game. And again, in case you didn't catch it when I was going over components, this is called uh, the... Um, Action or attack die. It invent the action die, and that's called the attack slash damage die, whichever oh. you prefer. All right, so that's that's about it for for that. All right, so we'll Once just you take our stuff to our sides. Yep, and, and then that stays in the middle, and then these we'll just leave up here. At that point, you if you you know you should have decided what you're going to be doing either a. The, the single scenario or jumping into the campaign, at that point you can yep. pull out the book and read. Okay, so at this point you're going to grab the scenario and again, we're just going to do the solo, or not solo, the single scenario, which is called a short adventure. Um, what you would do is you'd read backstory, then you're going to do some stuff, read some more story, do some stuff, uh, keep what... Uh, the stuff that he says to do, you read here and it, there's going to be some kind of roll or something that you do and then depending on what you get from the roll uh, there's either a critical success, a success, a failure, or a critical failure. Critical success is rolling a one. Success is matching your target number or lower. Failure is not matching your target number or higher and critical failure is the 20. You'll do the skill check, read the results, do whatever it says and then continue with the story. Do it then, again. Yeah and then Keep going, there's another one. In this particular case, there's another one. Yep, another one, read more story. story. And then, and then ta -da! this is the setup for the scenario. So you're going to read that, and uh, that's how you set up the actual scenario that you're going to do. So if you want to read that, and uh, I'll just grab the stuff. All right, so in this case, it's going to be assemble all the saving Sylvana cards. All right, so I have the four saving Sylvana cards. So I've got those here for now. A, a combat start and then it tells me to go read the section combat of the adventure rules. Which we'll explain in a second. Right. Henchmen. All henchmen cards with the keyword pirate and all henchmen cards with the keyword orc are used in this combat. So basically what's happening is we're just jumping into a um, a, a big old fight yeah. right now and it, now it's telling us how to get set up. And this is like basically the whole 
uh, point of this single short adventure. Right. So I've got the henchmen, all the henchmen cards. I searched through, and on the henchmen card, there is a subtype, and Mickey said orcs and pirates, right? Yeah. So I went through, and I grabbed all the orcs and pirates, and then I shuffled that, and that is the henchmen deck for this scenario. And then there is a threat value, which is number of heroes, and I, this is really hard to see, but there's a symbol for the number of heroes, yeah. which, if you look really, really close, it looks like a party of heroes. If you're looking back from it, it looks like a blob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically what it looks like. Uh, so it's the number of heroes times five, so in this case, the threat value would be a ten for us, because there's two player. Um, if some of the heroes failed the previous body control roll, the henchman cards, coward goblin, that were put aside, now come into play. Yeah, so in the parts that we skipped mm -hmm. for now, uh, there was some stuff involving goblins that they could show up, and that was just referring to that. So we're just right. going to assume none you of that You will happened. see some of this, but we're just, neat. we got more explanation to go over. Yeah. So, so um, Mickey said the threat value was five times number of players, so it's two. Two, so the total is ten. Yeah. What you do uh, for setup with the threat value is you are going to draw henchmen from the henchmen deck and place them left to right. And up top there is a small circle uh, that has a value in it. And this one is a four. So we're not at the threat value yet. Right. So, so keep going. Flip another. That's a four. So we're at eight. Flip another. It's a six. So now so we're now, over. Now we're over. We stop drawing. That's how you set up which henchmen start out. Okay, so basically that's what's standing in front of us. Yep. That we have to um, beat up on, basically. And the hero action is... Hero actions is guest name. Uh, which that'll be... There is a card, card for, for that. that. It says hero action guest name. We will just put this up here. I guess here. That is an action that all heroes are able to use, and it has some restrictions on it. So, Okay. Defeat. Every time a hero is disabled, you receive a doom counter. When you have a number of doom counters equal to the number of heroes, you lose the combat. Yes, so when your life gets down to zero, you are considered defeated, and there's ways to bring you back. But like that said, every time you get defeated... Or, you, what is it called? Uh, it is defeated. Mm -hmm. uh, disabled. Disabled. We're going to get one of these Doom tokens, and the losing require... Or the, if we get two, we lose. Yeah, if we get two, we're going to lose. So <laughs> If there was three players, if you get three, you lose. Right. And then I think, the, what, the victory conditions next? Okay. Victory, you are victorious when you defeat or, or put to flight all opponents. So... Either you basically kill the bad guys or you get them to run away. And then your reward um, are reward reward cards equal to the number of heroes. If you remember, Jeb showed you uh, during components a stack of cards that were uh, reward cards, which he has to the side right now. You shuffle those up, you draw two, and then the party among themselves can decide who gets, who gets what. Um, and, and then you... Uh, you record those on on your sheet so you know which cards you have access to because in between um, adventures or acts or whatever you call it you can um, have access to access them. to those cards but I believe you told me you can't go over 23 or 33 in your deck correct right you can only have three reward cards right. added uh, per act or adventure so uh, okay. Uh, so I don't think that box tells the rest the setup for this. Um, it just gives kind of like an overall thing for it. Or does That's it? actually it. And yeah, then it so then it then it has um, then there's text for what happens if you're defeated, and then there's text for what happens after victory. So we don't know what's happening yet. So right. So there's actually it. more to the setup that isn't provided in the the adventure part of the book. You have to actually look in the, the rules so, for setup. So more of a base, like this happens every time right. type of stuff. So we're going to grab the boss of uh, the Saving Sylvana. So the boss card will go to the left of all the henchmen. And that matters because monsters activate left to right. So he's always going to activate before the henchmen. 
And then there are the time scale cards, which we talked about earlier, which have the difficulty. So this is when you would decide what difficulty you want to pick. So you grab the card with whichever difficulty. We're going to play on normal. Normal. So we'll put that up here. And then it says start with seven time counters. So you put seven time counters on it. I think that's going to be seven, right? Yep. And we're just going to keep them right above the card and we'll chuck them away as they go. Um, so, in this particular case, unless Jeb doesn't want me to read this right now. You can go for it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, so, th th in this scenario, uh, we start with seven of these, like Jeb just put on, and then at five left, and at three left, and at one left, th it triggers this effect, and it says draw a new henchman card and place it to the right, like Jeb said, so. uh, over there. Um of the other opponents. So basically it's going to summon some more bad guys and then when it's at zero in his next turn the Cobalt the Cobalt has twice as many actions as normal. Okay so that kind of tells you what's happening as the adventure goes along. Uh, Another thing, which I read in the rules, and I don't know if you want to play like this, because it's really dependent on how people play. It says to put damage counters on them to show their life, and when you do damage, you take it off. So, I know when we played, when we did damage, we just put it on them. Uh, I, I'm a fan of taking stuff off, so, so however you want to do it. Alright, so in this part of the setup, if that's how you want to play, you would put the life on each of the people... Because so they actually give you plenty of tokens to yeah, do there's it. Yeah, there's tons this, of tokens. To it, do it this way, which is nice. Uh, you can tell on the enemy card, there's a number with like a little blood drop. That's how much life they start with. Right, so, so This is 18, 15, 15, and he is... Number of players times three. So that's just six, right? That is the setup for the scenario. All right, so we should probably talk about how the game's played now, right? Yep. So, this is going to be done over an amount of rounds. Uh, this kind of keeps track of what happens in the initial part of the rounds, but once all of these are gone, it, the game still plays. It's not like it ends. Uh, the only time it ends is when you meet the victory or defeat condition. So, right, so this is just a timer for... Basically, when the worst thing can happen, yeah. he goes twice if he's still in the game. And, he, and that's awful. And <laughs> when that says at zero time counters, that means every round it has zero. zero he's, he's going, going to uh, get twice as many actions as he normally has. Yeah, so that's bad. Yeah. So the last thing you do after you've got all this stuff yeah. is obviously you need to get your heroes ready. So you're going to get to draw, I think, five? Five cards, yeah. Like, Five. And there is a mulligan rule, and the mulligan for this game is you take the cards that you don't want, and then you shuffle them back into your deck, and then draw back up to five. Okay. So you get one mulligan in this game. Uh, we also need to determine a starting player. So one of us is going to get the starting. Doesn't I'll take really it. matter how you do it. We don't really care too much. So everybody now has their five cards in hand. And we have a starting player, so now we're going to start a round. So the round begins with any start of turn effects. So if anything's out on the field, then they happen now. Next, each player is going to draw two cards. And this happen happens simultaneously, so all players are going to draw two cards right now. So yes, it does even happen during the first turn after you've drawn your starting hand. You still get two cards. Yep. The next thing is to ready any exhausted cards. So if you have any cards that are exhausted, they're going to ready now. Exhausted uh, in this game is like any other game. Yep. It's basically tapped. Yep. <laughs> Turn to the side. That's exhausted. That's readied. Yep. After you ready all your exhausted cards, then you get to play up to two Endurance. And this is kind of one of the, the things that... Uh, I feel like some card games have economy that you spend to play cards. Endurance is kind of like mana in Magic. So, uh, 
When it says play up to two endurance, what you're going to do is take up to two cards from your hand and place them face down in front of you. And I'm just going to put it behind my hero because that's how I usually play. And endurance is what you're going to use to pay for cards, uh, either playing cards or using attacks, stuff like that. So at this point, you can play up to two, so you don't have to play two, you can play none, you can play one, just whatever you want to do. And so if you're wondering, uh, yeah, as far, as far as I've seen so far, there is, there are, I have not seen a card yet that lets you get those endurance cards, so you need to be real strategic yes. on what you put down on the table because you're not getting it back. Yeah, they were, it's very rare that you'll get it back. Yeah. So after everybody puts down their endurance for the turn, uh, now things are going to happen in turn order. So starting with the first player, they are going to get to take their turn, and then when their turn's done, the player to the left takes their turn, and so on. All the heroes take their turn, and then the bad guys are going to take their turn. Uh, after the bad guys activate, you are going to remove a time counter from the time scale. Which would just be move it off. Yep, and then check for the game effect. So and That means look down here and see if anything gets triggered. Yep, and then after that you're going to pass the starting token to the left. So I would pass it over to Mickey, and then we start the next round. Right, which would be unexhaust everything, etc., etc., draw your two cards, get ready to go again, yeah, and yep. do your endurance. Yep, so uh, that's what an entire round looks like, uh, just kind of the big picture of it. So we're going to actually need to talk to you about uh, what heroes can do on their turns, what the enemies do on their turn. So I guess we should just start with all the stuff heroes can do, right? Okay. And specific to this adventure, which we didn't read this card yet, is something that both heroes have the ability to do. Yeah. So I'll just read this to you guys. So in this um, in this short adventure here, uh, every hero one time, every hero max one times per turn. So that's saying that you can only attempt this one time on your turn, each round, obviously. Yeah. Okay. And then it has a little circle with a one inside. Anytime you see the circle with a one inside, it means you have to spend an endurance yep. to, to do it. And you can either like tap your endurance to mean that you spent it, or some people will like put it off to the side to show that they use it. Whatever you, you do, Whatever as long as you know. that you've already used it, that's, right. that's the point. So that's what a circle with a number inside means, how many endurance that you have to spend to be able to perform it. And then this this actually has three things. It says craft roll or a knowledge roll or a persuade roll. So that's when you would go to your card and see what you're the best at, yeah. basically. And so on the That would be the smartest thing to do. <laughs> on a craft roll, you're singing. And on a knowledge roll, you're taking a guess. And at on a persuade you're flirting with the bad guy. And again, the name of this card, if you didn't catch it, is called Guess the Name. Because this guy says, right? Yeah, it, his name actually is just question mark, question mark, question mark, the kobold. So we don't even know his name. And he has an effect that says, if you don't know his name, he takes no damage. So he's sitting there... For this adventure, we kind of have to guess what his name is. Yeah, or we can't do any damage to him. Right. Right. So that's so that's the point. So we would look at our cards, figure out who's best at what, and on our turn, if we think we could possibly do that, then we would. And then it says, um, which we didn't do yet, place, anyways, place three times the number of adventurer counters on this card, which is the axe with the sword on it. And for every successful roll, remove one counter. When all the counters are removed, we learn the kobold's name and can attack him like a normal opponent. Did you say three times or just three? Uh, oh, three, three times, times the, the number, number of adventures. So six. So that's one of the actions we can do on a hero turn. Now, the rest of what we're going to go over is what you will do the majority of the game, basically. One of the things you can do on your card, which is most common, is play a card. 
So to play a card, you pay the endurance cost, which in the top left of the cards in your, in your hand is the endurance cost. So this one costs one. So what I would do is exhaust one endurance to be able to play this card. Then I just read what it does. It's either going to be an instant kind of card where it gets the effect and it gets discarded. Instants are red? Yep. Or it's going to be one that will sit out in front of you, I guess like a permanent or continuous card. Yeah. So this one is uh, it's an attack card. And I put it out in front of me. And its effect is I can spend X endurance and tap it to make an attack. So that's playing a card. It's now in front of me. Components of a card real quick. Like Jeb said, the cost of the card, name of the card, set of the card. Um, this, in this case, it tells you who it belongs to. And then, like Jeb said, the effect. There's all kinds of different things. Uh, you, that one happens to be an attack. And another key is down here. It tells you what it is. So that has the, uh, it's a star basically part of like the pentagram thing and it says it's a spell um, and the reason that's in, important is because they're, if they're on, the, on the back of your which Jeb's pointing to right now on the back of your skill card it tells you what you're allowed and not allowed to have so when we when we just grab the 30 cards they kind of fix it right. so that it yeah. you don't have to worry about this but when you, your rewards and stuff it'll make yeah. a difference or if you decide to deck build yeah so this actually has that red pentagram on it, and it is a complex spell, so that is allowed in her deck. So that's what that symbol's for. Right. But just, so that's, and um, hopefully that I feel like most of the, the cards are pretty self-explanatory. The symbols are, you know, pretty yeah. self-explanatory on when you have to use an endurance, when you have to exhaust a card to use it, uh, tells you when... If it's an attack, it tells you when to uh, roll for damage and what to roll for damage, what the modifier is, and then any of the instant cards pretty much do a good job, I think, of telling you exactly what the effect of. I don't think when we did our trial run, we had a ton of, like, oh my gosh, I don't know what that means. Right, yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty clear. Simple. Yeah. All right, so that's playing a card. You can play as many as you can pay for from your hand. Uh, another thing you can do on your turn is make an attack. You can make three attacks on your turn, but they each have to be different types of attacks. So there is the melee attack, a ranged attack, and a magic attack. You can make one of each of them if you have it available and you can pay for it. Right. So Because a lot of the attacks tell you to use an endurance, which makes right. sense anyways. But there are a couple things that actually let you at least deal damage or whatever without even using right. an endurance. So that's pretty good. Yeah, so right now, well, I guess every hero has an inherent attack uh, on their card. Right. So since I'm a mage, it makes sense mine is a magic attack. And then the card that I played earlier is also a magic attack. So I have two attacks available to me, but I have to pick one of them because they're both the same type of attack. And me being an elf... I have a, my basic attack is a throwing knife, which is a ranged attack represented by the bow and arrow on the card, which, oh, it just happens to be my best stat anyways. Right. So that's my inherent attack. Um, so I come out of the gate with no melee attack and no magic attack. And I think Jeb comes out of the gate with no ranged attack and no melee, melee attack. Yep. Okay, so to make an attack, what you do is you pick the attack that you're going to use, you pay for it, so I guess I am just going to use my inherent attack. Uh, this says I spend one endurance, so let's tap my last endurance, then uh, exhaust this card, so I'll exhaust it, and it says make a magic attack. So the way attacks work, you are first going to pick your target, so we know we can't hit him, so I'm just going to pick the guy with the most life. So I'm targeting this guy, the pirate. The first thing I'm going to do is make a test on the type of attack that I'm using. So I have a magic stat on my card. It's a magic attack. So I take the d20. And if you can't read that, he's trying to get a 14 or less. Yep. So I'm going to roll it. I got a 6. So that means it succeeds. So uh, the attack is going to happen 
But now the opponent gets a dodge roll. So you are going to look at the opponent, and then there is a dodge uh, skill. And the dodge, value. the dodge skill is represented by a little boot symbol. I know you guys can't see the card, yeah. but it's the same place on all of them where Jeb's finger is pointing. There's a little boot. Yep. Um, none of these guys actually have the dodge thing, but we do as heroes yep. when they attack us. So since he does not have a dodge value, that means he doesn't get to make the dodge roll. So, uh, a however, dodge, if he did, if he did, what he, he would do is roll, roll the, the d20 and look to hit the target number or lower. Yep, and if he succeeds, he cuts all the damage that my attack's going to do to him in half. So, it's a good thing he doesn't have anything. So, I rolled the success. He can't dodge it. So, the next thing I'm going to do is roll the damage die. And I'm looking at my attack, and it says the damage is 1d6. So, I take my d6. I roll it. I got a 4. So, that means I'm doing 4 damage to him. So I look at his life, he's at 18, I'm going to take the 5 away and add a 1, so he has lost 4 life. And that's the only attack that I can do, because uh, my other one's a magic and I've already used a magic attack. I did make a mistake, he does have a shield on his card of oh, that's 1. that's what I was looking for. Yeah, so I do 4 damage to him, but he blocks 1 of it uh, right. because of that. So. so so real quick, I'm just going to go down the cards real quick. So the first one is life. The second one is their dodge value. The second one is their defense slash shield value. And the last one is the number of attack die they get when they attack you. Number of actions. Actions, sorry. Yeah. Said that wrong. So yes, the correct thing would have been I deal four damage, but he blocks one, so he's now at 15 life. Right, and if you're wondering about this guy, this has number of players, so this guy gets two actions a turn. Remember, when he runs out, he gets double it, so he gets four actions a turn. There's like, Heroes can equip armor to themselves, and you can only have one armor per body location. Uh, the armor card itself, you'll tap it when you take damage, and it prevents damage. So if somebody's attacking Mickey and he has this card out, it says, what, tap? It says pre it tap and prevent one. Yeah. So if I did... Or if, protect, I think. I if, don't know what it's called. Yeah. If a monster <laughs> did three damage to him, he would choose one piece of armor per attack and then tap it and then subtract one from it. So. Um, this one also has an ability where I can just straight up discard it and I can do it, block an additional three points, but then I don't have the card anymore. Remember what Jeb said about the armor and... Um, how, how many you can actually have on. This specifically says down on that there's a little picture of armor. says armor, and it tells you where it is. Yeah. It's a helmet. It goes on your head. So I can't put another helmet or headpiece if I ended up getting one right. out of my deck. Well, why would you put another one in? Well, don't forget, you got to generate endurance mm -hmm. every... Well, you don't have to, but if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. So... Even having extra pieces is not necessarily a, a bad thing. But just remember to look at armor pieces and make sure you don't already have uh, something that you can't use or can use or however you want to say it. All right. Then there are some cards in the Heroes deck that have their cost is a white number on a black background, which is different from all the other cards in their deck. And that means that card can be used on any turn, or it can be played any time. So this could even be played on the bad guy's turn if they're attacking or whatever. And like Jeb just showed you, that has a red yeah. background, and it's an instant. But notice that, like he said, that that can be used at any time. Notice this one is white with a black number. So this is an instant, but it's on my turn. Right. So just as a... And a side there, so you don't get confused, hopefully. All right. Then let's talk about critical successes and failures. So when I roll a d20 for either an attack or a skill check, if I get a 1 as a result, uh, which is the I for the d20, uh, it's considered a critical success, and I get to draw a card. That's the bonus of the heroes getting a critical success. On a critical failure, uh, when you get the 20, uh, it says the opponent randomly makes you discard a card. So you shuffle your, your hand 
and discard one randomly. Uh, next up are the fate points, which we should talk about. Uh, you can gain them if your attack fails or you defeat an enemy. So if I killed one of the henchmen or the boss, then I'd get one of the fate points. Uh, if I failed my attack roll, I'd get one of the fate points. These are finite. There's only four of them. So if Mickey had three and I had one and I killed a, a henchman, uh, what would happen is I'd actually take one from Mickey. So uh, you kind of have to think about that when you're holding them and stuff. And what the fate points are used for is it lets you draw a card. So if I have a fate point, I can spend it on my turn to draw a card. Or I can spend it to temporarily gain uh, an endurance. So like a floating, it's like floating mana in Magic where I'd spend it and be like, oh, I have one extra endurance to spend. Or I can spend it to re-roll the d20 when I make the attack or skill roll. So if I did hit that 20, I could spin the fate die to re-roll it if I want to so choose okay. to do so. But it doesn't work on the damage die, correct? Right. And then for adventure mode, you can also spin the fate point to allow another player to re-roll uh, their d20. So that's kind of... So if I have all the fate things and Jeb has a, a cruddy roll, I at least can get them either back in the middle or whatever and try to help out the you know the cause right because it doesn't it doesn't benefit me to hold them all if the, if my if my uh you know my adventurer partners are you know not doing well yeah and then when you defeat an enemy uh you like i said you gain a fate die or a fate point uh what happens to the henchmen is they get shuffled back into their deck uh, when the leader is defeated, it's just removed from the game. So that's what happens with uh, that stuff. So I think I've covered everything that happens on the hero's turn. All right. Yeah, so that's basically a hero's turn. And if any of that didn't make sense, watch the first couple minutes of gameplay and you'll get a better idea, um, you know, of, of the flow of things. Because it's kind of silly to try to go through right. every single thing that can possibly happen, but that's the gist of it. Yep. So, once all the heroes have gone for the round, it goes to the bad guys. And this is the not-so-fun part of the game, because right. they're going to start messing with you. Right. And like Jeb said, it uh, they um, activate left to right, so boss goes first. So we look at him, and we see that his number of actions is two. So when a bad guy ha uses an action, what they're going to do, you can just take whatever d20, doesn't matter, and you roll a d20 for each action. So for his first action, I'm going to roll it. He gets an 11. So on his card, it has the results for all the different rolls. So in his in his case, he has on a, on a 1 to 2, or on a 3 to 5, or on a 6 to 9, or on a 10 to 12, or on a 13 to 20. I've got an 11, so I go down here and I look at the um, 10 to 12 result, and it says he throws a healing spell and he heals all of his fellow warriors five life. Well, there goes that damage I did to that guy, so he would He's get back at three. full health. All right, so that was his first action. And just just as uh, just so you have an idea of what some of this stuff does, so like on a one one to two, he throws a cobalt curse. The hero with the most endurance card returns one random endurance card back to their hand, which is pretty awful because now you're yeah. down an endurance. I mean, yeah, you get to put it back, but you're you're down a card, basically. Three to five, it's Cobalt Scolding. The hero with the most cards in their hand discards one card randomly. That can hurt if you've got something good in your hand. Uh, a six to nine, he uses a heat weapon. The hero with the most fate takes one of her weapons in play back into her hand and loses 2d6 of damage. So that means you would roll 2d6 and take that damage. If she has no weapons, nothing happens. Um, in the case of a tie, heroes decide? Yes. And 10 to 12, we just went over. That's the healing spell. 13 to 20, though, nothing. He just has evil laughter. Right. Hugh evil laughter. <laughs> Sounds kind of like a horse. Yeah, it did. <laughs> All right, so he did one action. 
Roll for the second, a six. So what is that one? On the this skull. guy, he does... Oh, no, on I him. Yeah, we're still on... No, the six is the X. heat weapon. Oh, okay. So it's what... The that, hero with the most, well, so it's a tie because we both have none. Right. And then, what does it say? Yeah, Rolls but if you have if you have none, nothing happens. Oh, okay, so, then nothing happens. Right. All right. Because yours is a spell, not a weapon. So, spells aren't weapons, people. Once he's resolved, then we go to the next guy. He has one action, so roll for him. Ten. It's a ten. On a five to twelve, he makes a ranged attack. And the starting hero suffers 1d6 plus 2 damage. Alright, so he's targeting me because I'm starting player. So his, uh, what is the... 1d6 plus 2. Alright, so before he rolls that, I get to make my dodge attempt. Right. So I roll a d20. His I need target a number is 5. 5 or lower. And so I fail it. So now he gets to roll the d6. d6. Five plus two, two is seven. So since I have no armor to, to reduce that, I take my hero dial and go down seven. And that's the damage I He took. could have potentially had an instant two in his hand that did yeah. something, but as you know, he spent all of it on his turn, so oh, my even if he gone. has an in unless he has a zero cost instant that did something, he's just taken in the face. Yeah. So it, you kinda get the idea. So th okay. this one would go, go, this, this one, one go. go. Once all that's done, you are going to remove, remove the, the timer. timer. And if it triggers something, whatever. For... No, it doesn't trigger until okay. five. All right, so nothing would have happened. And then the passing, or I pass the starting token to Mickey, and we start the next round. And we just keep doing that over and over until something somebody. Happens. Yes, so I've got into combat, you check the victory or defeat conditions. Uh, when you're defeated, you discard all rewards gained in the adventure, and the act is restarted. So, since this is just the short adventure, that we don't have anything, but if we were in one of the longer ones, if we were in, like, Act 3, mm -hmm. uh, anything that we, any of the reward cards we would have gotten so far would go to the discard pile when we start. Alright, so, that's the defeat condition, or when you're defeated. If you win... Uh, you're going to consult the book, see what it says. Um, the first thing you do is, if your HP is below 30, uh, so if we had won and I was at 21, what would happen is my HP would go up to 30. And then uh, the next thing is shuffle all action cards into your deck. So your discard would get shuffled back into your deck. So it's like resetting your deck. Then you would regain your hero ability if you had spin it. And then you get the reward, which you would check the, the adventure book for uh, how many rewards are given. I know for this one, it's one per player, or one, one times the number of players. So what we would do is take the rewards deck, shuffle it, and then we would get two rewards. And then we would consult with each other about who would take what reward and uh, you have to make sure that it can go into your deck uh, looking at your deck restrictions and divvy them up that way. That kind of leads into uh, brief respites and these are what happen in between acts of an adventure. So we're playing a short adventure so we don't have to worry about any of this. But if you're playing like the three part or the three act adventure, in between each act, you're going to get a chance to use or to do a brief respite. And that happens uh, if you have any of these time counters left over when you finish the adventure. <laughs> also, <laughs> if, you, funny. if you decide not to take a reward, you get to acquire one of the time counters. Like, you just acquire a time counter to use for the respite. Oh, oh okay, that so. makes more sense. And during a brief respite, each player gets to choose from the following actions for each of the time counters that are remaining. So if we only had one time counter, Mickey and I would each get one action. Uh, the first is rest, which is heal five life. So, like I said, I was healed up to 30 at the end, but I could spin the time counter during the brief respite to go up to 35 if that's how I wanted to spend it. The next is preparation. Uh, you spend X time counters and you get to start the next act with a card from your deck 
put into play with that cost of X or less. Or, well, I guess X, you wouldn't pay over it. But when it says you can only do it once, does that mean for the whole entire adventure? No, just the, uh, for that respite. Oh, okay. So, in other words, if you had multiple time tokens, yeah, you're only had, allowed to do the prep once. Right. I so, gotcha. if you had eight available, you, yeah. you can't do two four cards. Gotcha. Or that would be broken. And then the last thing is Pray to the Gods, which is you get to take a uh, fate token from the middle only. You don't actually take it from other people. So you can spend one time counter to get a fate token to have for the next adventure or the next act. So that's what happens in the respite. And then you would just move on to the next act and keep doing all this until you finish the adventure. Uh, when an adventure ends, uh, it's when you finish the last act, you receive the rewards and experience points that it tells you. For experience points, the way you spend these, you can either pick a reward card that you gained during the entire adventure and write it down on your hero document. And that means it's available for you to use in following adventures. And you can only pick up to three, uh, take up to three of those from the written down things, uh, as we mentioned before. The other thing you can do with experience is permanently raise one of your stats by one per experience point to a maximum of four the the stat being raised by four you can't raise it five or more and then you that would be the end of the adventure when you go to the next adventure you can continue with you, the heroes that you have or you can restart or whatever but if you continue uh, with your heroes you're just going to start back at 40 hit points and no fate points so it's kind of like a full clean sweep when you move from adventure to adventure and that's everything. And yeah, yeah, and if that end stuff, like, that was a lot to take in. Yeah, that's... That's listed right out in the rule book. And since you only do it at the end, just go to, just go to that page in the right. rule book. Go step by step. It's not complicated. There's just... It just sounds like a lot when we talk about right. it, but it's really kind of pretty simple. And if you want us to record an actual adventure that has three acts so you can see all that stuff, leave a that comment, a, and yep. we'll, we'll get to it, so... Uh, we are going to come back with this Saving Sylvana scenario. We're going to reset up everything, and we're going to play through it two-player. And after that, we will have our review, and that's it. Right? Yep.